Thank you for joining the third annual Spring Financial Aid Webinar Series. This series is brought to you by the Northern California College Promise Coalition, or NCCPC for short. NCCPC is a collective impact coalition with over 40 members serving over 150,000 students across 12 Northern California counties. Our geographic footprint includes the nine Bay Area counties, Sacramento, San Joaquin, and Tulare counties. We bring over 200 leaders together through committees, convenings, and working groups around four key pillars. Number one, advancing public policy. Number two, building campus partnerships. Number three, scaling workforce pipelines and number four, convening communities of practice. Our members are locally and nationally recognized college access and success programs, advocacy organizations, college and neighborhood promise programs, K-12 and charter school districts, education technology nonprofits, individual advocates, and cities and mayors. We believe that working together we can impact systemic change on behalf of all of the students we serve and beyond. Uh, and now I'm very excited to introduce our speakers for today. Um, first up, we have Apri Medina, the Associate Director of Student Financial Support with the UC Office of the President. In addition, we have Jamal Collins, the Student Financial Support Analyst with the UC Office of the President. Jamal has 20 years of experience working in financial aid in California. As a California native, he is also a product of California public education, attending K through 12 schools, community college, and finally transferring to the Cal State University system. Apri has nearly 20 years experience in the University of California system, serving in various roles in financial aid and the registrar's office before joining the UC office of the president in 2021. In addition, if at any time during today's presentation you have questions for our presenters, please feel free to use the Padlet that we've dropped into the chat. We'll drop it again in a, in a moment. You can heart a question that you already see in order to upvote that question. And now we'll turn it over to our speakers to share their screen and introduce today's topic. Thank you so much and welcome everyone and thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here to talk to you about financial aid. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I know we had our intros um, provided, so we probably can skip this one, but I'm Capri Medina. Uh, I work at the UC Office of the President. I'll be covering the first few slides here with you all talking about um, how UC works in terms of our financial models and philosophy, sharing a few updates about FAFSA. Um, and then Jamal will take a majority of the presentation today. So here are our objectives. Uh, in today's session, we will again provide an overview of financial aid at UC, how our programs impact California students, again, what's new with FAFSA simplification. Uh, we'll also discuss how UC uh, packages financial aid and how outside scholarships are factored in. Lastly, we'll take a look at new and updated aid programs that uh, students at UC will benefit from. So first, let's start uh, looking at the UC financial aid philosophy. At UC, we view student financing as a partnership. And that partnership includes parents, for those students who are dependent upon a parent, um, who contribute based on their financial resources. The parent's contribution is determined by the financial information that they provide on the FAFSA application or the CADA, the California DREAM Act. The student's also a part of that partnership and will continue, sorry, and will contribute by working part-time and borrowing as necessary and responsibly. There are some goals that UC has around student borrowing that we'll cover later in the session, but students can look for outside and private scholarships to reduce their need to work and borrow. Many of our aid offices also encourage students to uh, continue to look for those resources while students. Sometimes what happens 
as I'm sure some of you uh, experience as well, is students kind of stop looking once they get into the university. Um, and we really try to encourage them that it's it's a continuous uh, uh, part of, you know, uh, if they want to go ahead and seek those resources, because there's many opportunities out there. The third member of this partnership is the university. Our role is to coordinate federal, state, and university resources to provide students with the most beneficial financial aid package based on a student's financial need and available funding. So during the 21-22 academic year, UC undergraduates received $2.4 billion in grant and scholarship funding. So it's an enorm enormous amount of funding, mostly from the state through the Cal Grant Program and through the University of California's need-based grant program. So this number also includes 56 million that students received from outside scholarships. These funds are going to yield big results for UC students. And all of this information um, can also be found in terms of how much financial aid students are receiving through the UC Info Center. I'd like to share that in case uh, you all like to access it. And we can share it later too in the chat. Because of the grant and scholarship funding available at UC, over 55% of California students receive enough grant and scholarships to cover UC tuition. Over 70% of California undergraduate students attending UC receive grants and scholarship. And with an offer of $18,000, many students are receiving help to cover costs be UC tuition. So that would include things like housing, uh, food, transportation, books and supplies. Again, many of our students are receiving a substantial gift aid above and beyond the cost of, of classes. So there's a hot topic, uh, what's new with FAFSA? <laughs> um, so on your screen, I've highlighted for you um, some of the top pieces that I drew out of a summary that was provided uh, by our California Student Aid Commission partners who uh, control CalGrant. Um, of the FAFSA simplification items, there are many other items aside from what's on this list, um, but again, I tried to draw out things that I felt directly affected students that you'd be working with. So in terms of the FAFSA changes, um, we have a few key changes that are coming up in the year academic year 24, 2024, 25. Okay? So not this coming fall, but for the next academic year. The FAFSA that controls that or that is applied to that year is going to now no longer account for the number in college, meaning siblings that were previously reported in the number in college that used to divide the EFC. For example, if you reported, I have two in college, myself as a student and my sibling, um, that used to divide the EFC in half, that component is uh, no longer. Um, and, you know, don't fret because the formulas have changed as well. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how that's more advantageous. Family size changes. Um, there are some definition changes on who counts uh, to be to being counted towards the number in household. Specifically, a student has to be, or sorry, a sibling has to be under the age of 19 and living in the house to count towards the number in family um, or under 24 if they're attending college. So a few of those pieces um, will change in terms of the family size that students will be reporting. One key big difference um, as a result of this act is that the Department of Education will allow families to consent for their information from the IRS to be transferred. Um, so key components like adjusted gross income and tax paid and which some of those elements were previously received, but now they're going to expand the number of data elements that can be transferred. As a result, the FAFSA will reduce in the numbers of questions. Um, I will note, though, that most families weren't completing every single question because of the smart logic that's built into FAFSA. So for some families, they may not see a huge difference because they were already filling out very, you know, the, a lower number of questions as a result of smart logic. But this is going to be um, significantly advantageous for those families who were having to fill in additional untaxed income components, for example. 
Um, we also have auto zero treatment that is going away. For those of you who might be versed in the EFC formula, there used to be a thing called auto zero um, for low income students who were on some sort of federal uh, needs benefit, uh, for example, SNAP or um, um, SSI benefits. Uh, while that component is no longer, um, there is it won't need to be because um, of the changes to the Pell Grant formula. So, for example, and I'm skipping ahead here a little bit, but for example, the Pell Grant will now uh, have a minimum maximum um, value and determination of that for some students is based on whether they file they're required to file tax returns, for example. So students who are no longer, or students and their families who are not required to file tax returns, um, meaning that they're not meeting the income thresholds to file, will be guaranteed the maximum Pell eligibility. And their student aid index, formerly known as EFC, that's another part of this change, um, will automatically be a negative value. So now the e SAI, we're calling it student aid index, formerly EFC, uh, can go negative, up to negative 1,500. So there are certain uh, advantages to these changes. I will say by and large, most of these are resulting in increases in the amount of Pell Grant to our students. Um, the students where who are on the margins of Pell Grant eligibility who have higher incomes. So for example, families above 60, 60,000 and below will not have to report assets, but families above that who may have larger assets, for example, uh, who, who wind up having a higher student aid index value uh, may no longer qualify for Pell Grant. Um, so again, there are certain changes that are going to affect probably more middle income to high income families, um, especially because of that number in college removal. Um, some other uh, important changes. Previously, small business and family farm assets were not on the table in terms of assessing a family's wealth. Uh, that has been removed, and those assets will now count on the FAFSA. However, money too that's given to a student from like a grandparent for their birthday or things of that nature, that question has been uh, removed and will no longer count towards the student's contribution. And again, I mentioned there is a new Pell formula. The Pell is based on uh, this student aid index, but it's actually a, a kind of a workflow, essentially. A student can qualify for that maximum Pell grant by not being required to file. Um, they can qualify for a partial Pell, whatever the maximum minus their student aid index. Um, so again, if their student aid index is does not exceed the maximum Pell value, they may qualify for whatever that portion of Pell grant is. I will say that the maximum for this next year is about 6,700. So looking ahead to 2425, you know, that would mean a student aid index of no more than that. A student might have the possibility. Uh, but again, it's going to be based on uh, family size and the percent of poverty level of the income of the family uh, for partial eligibility. And then there are families who will qualify for a minimum Pell Grant as well. And with that, uh, I know that's a lot of information. I just wanted to give some highlighted notes. One other element is that uh, the FAFSA Typically, as you all are accustomed to over the last, since 2017-18, has been made available October 1st. Um, because of the substantial changes that are going into the application for 2024-25, that application is supposed to open this October. The Department of Education has notified the community that um, it, it's not looking likely that they will make that target date. They are not willing to commit to the October 1st date. Uh, so what we're hearing is that it's most likely going to be January 1st. Uh, what does that mean for our students? Well, at UC, um, we, you know, in terms of, we, that, that's how the, the FAFSA worked in prior years, prior to 1718. Uh, we are going to be ensuring that students have uh, a substantial messaging in terms of making sure that they apply by March 2nd for new students for the state deadline. But aside from that, UC has very generous financial aid programs. Um, we're going to provide assistance to students uh, based on their financial need. Um, so it does condense the timeline somewhat. Uh, we are con somewhat concerned about that. But because we've been here before, um, we're, we're welcoming a lot of these changes. We've done a lot of modeling and have noted that our students are advantaged under this new uh, simplified FAFSA and the new Pell formula.
So with that, I'm sure there'll be questions. I'm happy to take those later, but I'm going to go ahead and pass it to Jamal, who's going to talk a little bit about um, financial aid and scholarships that you see. Thank you, Pri. Um, so UC is committed to providing students with the most beneficial financial aid package possible. And outside scholarships can play a key role in doing so. When offering a student financial aid, we must also adhere to federal and state regulations. In the next slides, I will explain the factors that must be considered when adding an outside scholarship to a student's financial aid package and provide examples of how outside scholarships may or may not be, require an adjustment to an initial financial aid offer. So many times the university is notified of an outside scholarship offer after a student has received their initial financial aid package. There are three factors that a financial aid office must consider when adding an outside scholarship to a student's package. I'm advancing too fast there, sorry. First, uh, does the student have financial need? We'll look at how financial need is determined and how a scholarship can cover um, the remaining unmet need in a few slides, in the next few slides. Beyond that, we will examine also the cost of attendance, which limits the total amount of financial aid in which a student can receive, and that includes grants, scholarships, work study, and loans. And lastly, aid offices must consider scholarship restrictions. Scholarships sometimes come with instructions for how they can be used, and this can have an impact on how the scholarship is added to a student's financial aid package. So first we're gonna review financial need. Financial need is determined by taking the cost of attendance, in this example, $36,700, and subtracting the student aid index which is determined by a FAFSA or the California Dream Act application. The number this equation produces is the student's gross need. In our example, the student has a zero um, student aid index, and so their gross need comes to $36,700. Once we determine a student's gross need, we can determine the amounts of federal, state, and UC gift aid the, uh, the student is eligible for. Based on this student's need and the funding available, the student is eligible for a total of $26,200 in gift aid. After we've maximized the student eligibility for gift aid and we determine um, what need based self then we determine what need based self help aid the student is eligible to receive need based self help includes subsidized loans and work study in this example the student is offered $7500 in need based self help aid adding those two figures together the student is offered a total of $33700 in need based aid So with a gross need of $36,700 and a maximum offer of need-based aid at $33,700, this student has an unmet need of $3,000. Because there is no additional need-based aid uh, to offer this student, um, the student might be initially offered a non-need-based aid, like an unsubsidized loan, to fill in that, um, that gap. So here is how we prioritize adjustments to aid to account for financial need. 
Our first priority is to cover unmet need. In this example, if a student receives an outside scholarship for $3,000, which is the unmet need, or less, it would go towards covering whatever the unmet need is by adjusting that non-need-based aid offer. If the student receives an outside scholarship greater than $3,000, but less than $10,500, we would first cover the unmet need. And that's specific to this example because of the numbers we're using here. So those could change depending on the student, um, the student's information. But based on this example, if the student receives a scholarship greater than $3,000 and less than $10,500, uh, we would first cover the student's unmet need, as indicated in the first priority, and then we would make adjustments as needed to the self-help aid. And lastly, where student scholarships cover more than their unmet need and need-based need self-help aid, an adjustment to the student's gift aid would be required. Beyond need, the total amount of financial aid a student can receive is also limited to the student's cost of attendance. In our first student example here, the student has an SAI of zero, which, mean that, which means their parents are not expected to contribute anything towards the student's education. The student has offered $26,200 in gift aid from the university and a total self-help aid of $10,500. So that can include subsidized loans, work study, and even unsubsidized loans. These amounts combined cover the student's cost of attendance of $36,700. So the student has maxed out their eligibility um, with the funds that were offered. If the student receives an outside scholarship of $1,000, their financial aid will then exceed the cost of attendance. To comply with federal financial aid requirements that limit a student's aid to the cost of attendance, an adjustment will need to be made to the student's financial aid package. student's gift aid, which that would reduce the gift aid by $1,000. These adjustments would be required to keep the student's aid package within the cost of attendance, which is a federal requirement. Um, and a lot of times that could be, if a student sees an adjustment like that, they could think, you know, what's going on. Um, this is actually a good case for a student. They are not required to borrow and their full cost of attendance is covered. In the next example, the student has a student aid index of 7,000. This student is offered gift aid of $19,200 and self-help aid of $10,500. The parent contribution of 7,000 for the sake of this example, we'll say um, the parent is taking out a PLUS loan. That combined with all the other aid the student off is offered equates to the total cost of attendance of $36,700. If this student were to receive an outside scholarship of $1,000, an adjustment would be made 
to keep the award totals within the cost of attendance. Where that adjustment would need to be made is determined by the student need. Um, so embedded within the student self-help is an unsubsidized loan that we would adjust to allow for the scholarship to fit. This, this would keep the student's package within the cost of attendance and ensure um, that his package is in compliance. In the case where this student received a combination of outside scholarships totaling $11,500, an adjustment would have to be made to the account to account for the student's need as well as their cost of attendance. In this case, we would eliminate the self-help and would also need to adjust the student's gift aid by $1,000 to keep them within the limits of the cost of attendance. But we're not done yet. Our goal is to make sure the student has the most beneficial financial aid pos package possible. So we would redistribute where the loans are coming from by reducing the Parent PLUS loan by $2,000 and covering that with an unsubsidized student loan of $2,000. We do this because the interest rate and fees on the unsubsidized student loan are more favorable than those of the PLUS loan. Next, we're, we'll look at a quick example of restricted scholarships. In this example, the student receives a Cal grant, which is uh, 12, uh, awarded at $12,570, and a scholarship for $5,000. As you see uh, in this chart, the Cal grant is restricted to paid tuition, and the scholarship was sent to the university with instructions that it also pay tuition. In a case like this, we would need to reduce the Cal grant by $5,000 in order to allow the scholarship to fit within the financial aid package. Next, we'll do a quick view of new and updated programs. So UC in partnership with the state is committed to creating a debt-free pathway to undergraduate education for California students by 2030. The 2022-23 year saw the first phase of this program where newly enrolled California students at UC with zero ESCs from LCFF plus schools received augmented financial aid offers um, and work study opportunities such that they could complete their program while working part-time alone. Students retain the option to borrow if needed. And for the next year or the next phase, which will begin in fall 2023, UC is expanding this program to all California newly enrolled undergraduates with a zero SAI. In addition to that, uh, you may have heard about our Native American Opportunity Plan, also known as NAOP. UC's Native, Native American Opportunity Plan ensures that in-state system-wide tuition and student service fees are fully covered for California students who are enrolled in a federally recognized Native American, American Indian, and Alaska Native tribes. This plan applies to undergraduates and graduate students. And to be eligible, a student at UC must be uh, a California resident or deemed a California resident for tuition purposes. They must be enrolled in a qualifying UC degree program and be an enrolled member in a federally recognized Native American, American Indian, and or Alaska Native tribe. They must also apply for financial aid by submitting a FAFSA or California Dream Act application.
I'm gonna go ahead and drop a link to the Native American Opportunity Plan site and the chat there. In addition to that, um, the state beyond invest or revamping the Cal Grant program has also made major investments in the middle class scholarship program, also known as MCS 2.0. These investments will allow for awards to be determined based on the cost of attendance, which will increase the number of eligible students. Formerly, this program was limited to the cost of tuition. Increases, uh, they've also increased income caps, income and asset caps for the 23-24 year to $217,000. The goal of this program once fully funded is to get uh, students to a self-help or a loan work expectation of $7,898. That, that's in line with um, the debt-free program that UC is, uh, is has as one of its goals. And I believe there is some additional information that APRI has about how the middle class scholarship program impacts um, outside scholarships as well. Yeah, just briefly, um, uh, because you may be hearing from students on this, uh, all scholarships. So under the prior middle class scholarship program, um, only outside scholarships were accounted for in the legislation. Under the MCS, the Middle Class Scholarship 2.0 program, all scholarships are factored into the award eligibility, which means that you know, students who are bringing in outside scholarships or who get campus-based uh, scholarships, um, including um, need-based awards from areas like basic needs, at the present time, the legislation doesn't make a distinction um, between uh, between campus programs. So outside scholarships are, are accounted for that exceed that self-help of 7898. So anything above that. So that's pretty rare. <laughs> um, but campus awards like academic awards, again, basic needs, they're all lumped into campus aid that's provided to the student. So it affects uh, the program in a much larger way. Um, so this is resulting in a lot of back and forth uh, currently on the student's eligibility. So as students assigned their award at the beginning of the academic year, for example, they acquire some sort of other assistance, their award continues to change throughout the year. Um, so we are advocating at this time, uh, along with our CSU colleagues, for some adjustments, some amendments, I should say, to the um, trailer bill language that was that, is, that established this program. Um, to recognize that not all campus aid is the same, and that if we're going to um, affect eligibility, we would like those other non-need-based forms of gift aid that come from outside of financial aid uh, to be treated similarly to outside agency scholarships. So again, that's what we're advocating for. Um, the legislature has, of course, to has to buy in. So. Uh, just wanted a, a heads up that the program is very different at this stage. It is it's essentially, you know, almost an entirely new program um, because not now, not just middle class students, it's also the students um, who have lower contributions from the FAFSA, even zero, zero EFC slash SAI students are receiving some, you know, amount, even if it's nominal uh, from this program. Uh, and as a result, you know, it, it, there was a complete overhaul. So I just wanted to provide that update that, you know, if students come to you not understanding or, you know, uh, that that's part of the part of what's happening is we believe it was an unintended consequence um, of how the, the legislation was was written. So we are we are doing our due diligence and we're hopeful um, that the legislature will uh, will will hear those you know concerns and be able to make amendments for the future of the program. Thanks, Supreme. So another thing that's important to you see is ensuring that we're meeting the basic needs of students. Um, over the last several years, you see has been working to develop new policies, programs, and services to meet 
uh, the university's strategic vision of providing a college experience where all students have what they need to thrive personally and academically. So with that, all 10 UC campuses have on-site basic needs centers providing food, emergency housing, and a comprehensive range of support services. Any UC student can use these services at the basic needs center nearest to them, not just on their campus where they are enrolled. The number of students served demonstrates the need for these services. Over 48,000 students were served during the 29-20 fiscal year alone. The state has also supported the university's efforts by providing $18.5 million in support annually for basic needs support. In addition, uh, students can tap into our financial wellness services, financial wellness and financial literacy, literacy services as well. Each campus has a financial wellness program that provides support and guidance to students to help them navigate their finances in a way that supports their overall well being. These programs offer workshops, coaching, and online education aimed, to, aimed at educating students on how to make the best financial decisions and to know who, when, and why um, to ask for help when needed. So let's look at uh, some resources. The UC Financial Aid page is geared towards prospective students and their families. It is the hub for information regarding uh, our system-wide financial aid programs with tips for completing the financial aid application process. It also links to um, our campus financial aid uh, websites and tools. We've also produced a series of short yet helpful videos on an array of financial aid topics, such as the cost of attending UC, how to read a financial aid award letter, and ways of saving costs while in school. Uh, a pre a meant, had mentioned this before, and I believe that the link is in the, um, the chat. Um, the UC Info Center as a way to explore the UC story through data. It's a very helpful site, it has tons of data. Uh, it's home to the UC affordability report or accountability report, which has information on UC undergraduate admissions and enrollment, uh, undergraduate affordability and student success. So just a quick recap, um, within the regulations set by the U.S. Department of Education, UC is committed to providing students with the most beneficial financial aid package available. The university is dedicated to creating predictability when it comes to costs, while simultaneously improving the student's educational experience as well. Um, we're also really diving into creating pathways for a debt-free education with the goal of having that available to all California students by 2030. Uh, student basic needs is an area of importance to the UC and the university is committed to working on eliminating food and home insecurity. And lastly, the university understands the need for financial education and has uh, ways of offering students so services and support to that end. And that's all we have for today. Uh, we can go to some questions. Really fantastic presentation, Jamal and Apri. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, folks, please take a moment to use your Zoom reaction to just uh, show your appreciation for Jamal and Apri's uh, really detailed comprehensive presentation. Um, we do have a few, uh, actually several great questions that has come in from the audience. Um, folks, go ahead and keep posting. Um, if I've hearted it, that means it's uh, slated for this Q&A. 
uh, noting we do have 17 minutes, so we'll get through what we can and we'll follow up with our presenters offline for anything we aren't able to review today. Uh, so there have been two questions that have come through around self-help expectation. Um, would it be possible to just explain a little bit more about um, how it's calculated, what's the formula, um, it, what is the, uh, how does it change per year, and if it's state, uh, set by the state or the campus? I can take it. Um, so self-help is a, uh, it's actually done by the system-wide office, our office. Um, what we do is we take into account the financial need, the average financial need of the campus, uh, of all the campuses. Uh, financial aid through our university-wide um, student, the student UC grant program is funded by tuition dollars. So what we do is we determine the total amount of net revenue essentially and we're portioning it out amongst the campuses based on their level of need um, for their populations. And the reason that we do that is because uh, students, you know, we want students to not be prohibited from attending a campus just because, you know, they happen to be a higher need campus um, or a more expensive campus for that matter. So this allows us to ensure equity um, amongst our student populations across the UC system. Um, and so we funnel those dollars accordingly uh, based on that calculation. It's more complex than this. I'm just giving you a kind of holistic bird's eye view. Um, and then essentially the campus sets their self-help. Uh, typically what they're doing is they're looking at their um, overall pot, you know, of gift aid as calculated by our office, and they are dividing that accordingly uh, amongst their eligible population for gift aid recipients. Great, thank you so much for that, Apri. Um, the next question uh, we have is, does the UC's total calculation, uh, total cost calculation, excuse me, include things like childcare, menstrual hygiene and products, and chronic health-related costs? Um, so it doesn't automatically include childcare. Um, but that can be added on to the cost of attendance. Um, as far as, I'm sorry, what were the other, the other items as well? Sure, uh, it's menstrual hygiene and then chronic health related costs. Uh, so uh, of course students are expected to have uh, a health insurance while they're in school um, and that's added into the budget. Um, if, if for some reason they have costs that exceed what um, their insurance will cover, that can also be added in through a budget, uh, cost of attendance budget appeal. Um, as far as the the other items, I believe that would fall under the miscellaneous personal items, which is also factored into the cost of attendance. And we do have um, what we call cost of attendance surveys that we conduct for our students. So students actually inform the information that campuses use uh, it's a system-wide survey. So again, our office conducts it um, and it collects information on various questions. And what, some of those questions are around medical expenses and personal expenses, such as some of the items that were listed. Um, so we are getting th that kind of information from students, but again, it's uh, in terms of the, what's included in the cost components, they are averages for larger kind of umbrella items. So, you know, within personal expenses, um, uh, we have, you know, things like incidentals, um, clothing. Uh, so th that kind of, those little sub categories are within there. They're not going to be specific to those particular items, but we are getting at kind of students' average expenses for some of those areas. And again, as Jamal mentioned, there are ways that if a student, especially for a student with a chronic health condition, is probably experiencing consistent um, financial burden as a result of that, uh, they we would encourage them to speak with their financial aid office because they likely have higher costs than what the averages represent. Thank you to you both for that um, detailed explanation. Appreciate it. Um, and I am doing my best to consolidate notes, uh, what we're hearing as answers and posting them to the questions in the Padlet. Um, next question. Uh, can you uh, 
clarify how the UC calculates the average housing costs at the off-campus level? Might be a good segue from that last one. Yeah, so as Pri Priya had mentioned, um, there there is information that's provided by students through our uh, cost of attendance survey um, that help us make those determinations as far as uh, cost of housing. Um, I believe also there, so because the, the the survey is done, I believe once every other year, um, there may be like um, uh, inflation calculations that carry it over before the next data set comes through. Yeah, it, right. So we do, do factor inflation into those estimates um, of what students report. We also average, or we also look to uh, local area. So like HUD information about regional differences, um, because we know sometimes uh, students may, and we have redefined questions for students on how they answer what they're paying for rent uh, to better capture what the, their true costs are. So we're looking at a variety of resources to determine those estimates for off-campus housing. That's great, thank you. Um, I am going to go to a few more. Uh, let me just see, make sure there isn't. Um, since uh, I'm gonna try to focus a little first on the things that are technical or tactical, um, tactical folks, and then I'll move to advocacy questions. Um, for clarification, UC students can access a basic need resource center of any UC campus, not just their enrolled campus? That is correct. So say, for instance, a student is uh, not near their campus, maybe they're, you know, visiting another campus and they run into an issue, they can access services at the closest campus that they're, they're near. That's great. Thank you. Uh, thank you to whoever asked that question for clarification. That's really um, a fantastic resource to make sure our students are aware of. Um, we have a few questions uh, related to um, MCS 2.0. And I think some of this might have been referenced earlier, but just repeating it. Uh, we've been hearing MCS 2.0 is causing several students at the UC to see their award letters get reduced because of receiving emergency basic needs aid. Have you heard this too? Have all MCS 2.0 grants been dispersed for the year already? And what is the typical timeline of those disbursements? So yes, um, UC is aware that uh, basic needs awards are affecting the middle-class scholarship. Um, um, I, I mentioned earlier, we, we are advocating along with our CSU colleagues for a change to the legislation because we do believe this was an unintended consequence of how the middle-class scholarship was revised as a program. So we are doing our best to, to ensure we raise up those concerns um, and not just basic needs awards, but you know, also specific scholarships for underrepresented populations. Um, for example, our former foster youth, we have scholarships at certain campuses that get provided to them that may be impacting uh, their middle-class scholarship as well. So we are doing our best to try to raise those concerns to the state legislature. Um, and I'm sorry, I forgot the other, uh, what was the other component? Um, have they all been dispersed by the UC for the year or the status of the disbursement and then the timeline for disbursement? Yes. So all campuses have issued their fall disbursements at this point. Uh, it took them a while to award um, because we uh, didn't have guidance on the formula for determining the award. So it was a much, it was a very much wait and see on what the students were eligible for. Um, there's been additional guidance since then, so awards are coming out faster. Uh, so I believe at this time, all this, there's, we have two semester campuses. The semester schools have issued uh, their spring semester disbursements. Uh, the quarter schools, I believe, all also have um, dispersed their winter quarter disbursements, but spring will will pay when spring aid goes through, which is typically uh, middle of middle of this month, actually. Um, so right before the term starts for spring. Thanks for that, Apri, especially for breaking it down by the different term types. Super helpful. Um, let's see. It looks like there was a question, but someone might have answered it. Is there a website for more information on the debt-free program and 
one has been provided, um, but do either of you want to go a little bit more into that question? A website for more information on the debt-free program. Um, I went ahead and listed that answer. Um, Perfect. I, I just said that the program was a soft launch this last year. So it was a very, very small group of students who were eligible. So we didn't want to put out information because uh, the, 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 the program is still developing. This next year, a much larger swath of students um, are going to be considered. And so, yes, information will be posted to the link to the admission site, uh, I believe under tuition and fees. Is that correct, Jamal? Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and that's going to be done in the near future um, prior to those students being selected. That's great news. Thank you for that. And I believe I see one last unanswered question. So if folks have anything else burning, this is the time to add it. Uh, the question, oh, I just lost it. What would be the most favorable, favorable conditions for outside scholarships? For example, where should they be allocated if a student is Cal Grant eligible? I would say, and Apri can, she can jump in. I would say if, if, if it was unrestricted, that would be the best case scenario. <laughs> um, if a scholarship doesn't have instructions for what it needs to be applied to, then the university can make the determination of where it would be most beneficial for the student. That's great. And I did see one last question that I overlooked related to scholarships. Um, and this will be the last one. Let me see. There might be time for one last one after this. How is the new legislation that Governor Newsom passed going to affect adjustments and this formula to accommodate outside scholarships, if at all? And I believe that's in reference to AB 288. Um, AB 288, yes, uh, for the, I, I would say uh, that doesn't, um, UC was already compliant with that. We already, and as Jamal demonstrated during the presentation, uh, when outside scholarships come in, our ultimate goal is to make sure that the student has the maximum benefit from all of their gift aid. So the first area we apply a scholarship to is unmet need, as um, Jamal mentioned. Then we target non-need based aid, things like parent loan and unsubsidized loan. Then we, you know, then we target subsidized loan and work study. You know, we, we go from what's least beneficial and if there's any gaps uh, to other types of need-based aid. And then before we touch any kind of gift aid, we're reaching out to students to see if they have any higher educational related costs, like uh, if they need to purchase a computer, you know, it's their first year, things like that. Um, it is extremely rare that even before this bill passed that we would, um, that it, outside agency scholarships would affect gift aid because typically, again, as Jamal demonstrated, the self-help is, is, you know, was a lot of space for students to be able to fill that area uh, with other gift aid from outside sources. Um, in terms of uh, moving forward, I will say the one thing in the legislation, it does though indicate that we um, need to comply with federal law. So we still have to meet a student's financial need and their cost of attendance ceilings. So, you know, if a student were to get $25,000 in scholarships for a year, it's likely we would need to adjust some sort of gift aid at that point because it's unlikely a student has, you know, substantial that, that level of uh, increased costs for the academic year. Um, so we are still held to the federal standards, um, but for the, for 99% you know, of our students, it was not uh, it was not an issue prior to the bill. Um, uh, and our and, and moving forward, yeah, we're we are we are um, factoring that in. So because it's part of our practice. And Jamal, did you have anything else to add? Um, I when I think about you know the the whole question around. Um, outside scholarships, uh, it, it just harkens back to uh, a lot of times this information comes in after uh, aid has already been offered, and sometimes even after aid is dispersed. And so students may feel like, you know, oh, I got the scholarship, and they're expecting money in hand after all their aid is dispersed. And if an adjustment has to be made, even to their non-need-based aid, a lot of times that will happen, and it may feel like they're not getting anything, but they they actually are. Um, they're is reducing their overall debt, um, and they're getting a more beneficial package, basically. 
Thank you for that, Jamal. Thank you, Apri. Thank you to you both for your time. We're going to conclude the Q&A and start to close out the session. But is there anything last that you would like to share out to the group before we close out the workshop? And, um, after you all, the Zoom manager will take it over. Um, I would just say thank you so much for attending. I, I know some of this can financial aid is very complex. Uh, so we, we always encourage folks to re reach out to the financial aid offices. Uh, they have teams who are, are there to help, even if students are not enrolled, uh, including for yourselves. So, you know, if you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out uh, to our campuses and or uh, Jamal or myself, um, you know, we, we're, we're also here to assist. And I'll just say uh, thank you. And thanks, Mara, for putting on these uh, great webinars for folks as well, for folks to come together and hear about the programs that we have available and um, all the things we do for our students. We want to thank all of our incredible presenters from across 10 partners who shared their gifts of time, talent, and treasure with us over the last four weeks from February 23 through March 16, 2023. Whether you attended one session or more, please complete our exit ticket and let us know how we can enhance these sessions and this series for future years. Thank you to our generous partners for providing our wonderful gifts for our series raffle. You can win one of five prizes, like a backpack filled with goodies from our steering committee member, MoneyThink, a $100 athletic gift card, or a Gap Bank swag bag. Don't forget to check out the rest of this YouTube playlist for more great content from our partners. Thank you again to our 10 partners from across the state of California, the University of California, the California State University, the California Community Colleges, the California Student Aid Commission, ScholarShare 529 and CalKids, AICCU, or the Association for Independent California Colleges and Universities, the California Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators, and Decided Powered by MoneyThink. We also want to give special thanks to our connector sponsor, the College Futures Foundation, and to all of our generous sponsors. This free four-week webinar series is brought to you by the Northern California College Promise Coalition, our members, our sponsors, our partners, and more. We invite you to share this series with your colleagues, students, and families across California. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us.